Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Rose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Rennie Grills from Mewasin Valley Authority will be talking about enhancing grassland bird and species at risk habitat in a semi-urban setting, challenges and opportunities. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a, in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Stay tuned for upcoming native prairie speaker series. Leila Benmaruche, an applied research associate at Saskatchewan Polytechnic, will be talking about harnessing technology, unmanned Aerial Vehicles, UAVs for Natural Resource Management, on Wednesday, April 4th, that's next week at noon. Check out the PCAP website for more information or to register. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by Environment and Climate Change Canada, Eco-Friendly SASC, Information Services Corporation, Ranchers Stewardship Alliance, Inc., SASTEL, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by Miwasin Valley Authority. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation. Questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now, a bit about our presenter. Rennie grew up on a mixed farm at St. Benedict, Saskatchewan, and has a degree in plant ecology from the University of Saskatchewan. He has spent his 25 plus year career managing conservation lands across the three prairie provinces with Ducks Unlimited Canada, Nature Conservancy of Canada, and Canadian Wildlife Service. In 2015, Rennie found his dream job as the resource management officer with Miwasin managing the South Saskatchewan River Valley and Miwasin's conservation sites. In his spare time, Rennie has a small conservation consulting company, serves as a weed an RM weed inspector, and assists his wife Lisa with her business called Blazing Star Wildflower Seed Company. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Rennie. Thanks, Caitlin. I'm loading up my presentation here. Can you see it? Yes. Everything okay, looks perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, Caitlin. So yeah, I'm. Uh, my name is Ronnie Grills. I'm the resource management officer here at Miwasin Valley Authority here in Saskatoon. And uh, I was asked by Caitlin and actually a friend of mine, uh, Sue Mikulski with the Rancher Stewardship Alliance, if uh, if I could give a presentation about some of the work that we're doing here in the Saskatoon region on um, managing our conservation sites for grassland bird habitat and also species at risk. So uh, today's topic uh, or today's discussion I'll be sort of focusing on some of the different activities that we're doing uh, within the area uh, for those for our habitat programs. Just a little bit about Miwasin. <clears throat> Miwasin was created in 1979 through the Miwasin Valley Authority Act and uh, we're responsible for conserving and managing uh, roughly 6,700 hectares of conservation lands up uh, along the South Saskatchewan River, approximately 80 kilometers of river valley north and south of the city of Saskatoon. Uh, within our conservation zone, we have uh, multiple conservation sites that we manage. Uh, different uh, sites including uh, uh, river islands, islands in the river valley, and also uh, numerous grassland sites as well, and also the riverbank. Uh, a couple of our more popular uh, grassland sites are the Miwasa Northeast Swale, which is actually within the city limits at the northeast side of the city. Also, uh, Saskatoon Natural Grasslands, which, which is actually surrounded entirely by the city. And then uh, two conservation areas on the south side of the city, uh, Beaver Creek Conservation Area, where we have an interpretive center, and then Cranberry Flats Conservation Area. Our mandate, is uh, to both uh, conserve the river valley and uh, these natural areas, also to educate people about them, and then also develop them and to provide uh, access to the river valley and these conservation areas. So we, so we sort of work together with these three mandates to provide uh, 
conservation education and access uh, to these conservation sites. The, uh, this project that I'm speaking about is um, we have received funding from Environment Canada through the climate change, uh, through the Habitat Stewardship Program, Species at Risk, uh, to uh, do work on these conservation sites to enhance them for grassland bird habitat. So we're just finishing up our year two of the project and moving into year three. Also, uh, TD Friends of the Environment have been uh, big supporters of Miwas and through our BioBlitz and uh, EcoBlitz uh, programs, and which involves our long-term monitoring programs. And I'll talk a little bit about that in, throughout the presentation. Also with Miwas, and, uh, we, as part of the Miwas and Valley Authority Act, we have three participating parties which provide us with core funding, uh, the City of Saskatoon, the University of Saskatchewan, and uh, the provincial government. Uh, with the part of their our, uh, participating parties, they provide core funding, but also our responsibility is to manage their sites. So 42% uh, of the sites that uh, the lands that Miwasan manages are actually provincial crown lands within the Miwasan Valley. So just, uh, I'm going to talk about, our, the main site that I'm going to focus on is the Miwasan Northeast Swale, but I'm also going to discuss two other sites. Uh, so the, the swale uh, starts within the city limits at Pedersen's Ravine along the South Saskatchewan River. If you're familiar with Saskatoon, uh, the location is approximately uh, at the Pedersen's Ravine is where it enters into the South Saskatchewan River, uh, which is just on uh, Central Avenue uh, on the northeast side of the city. Uh, the swale extends 26 kilometers to the north and east and par runs parallel to the river. and um, it drains in two other locations, one location at uh, Bosco Homes, and then the second, uh, the final location where it drains out and ends is just past the Clarkboro Ferry Cross between Warman and, Sask and Aberdeen. Uh, the swale is actually a, a post-channel glacial scar of the South Saskatchewan River, and so it's an old uh, channel. And it, it provides sort of unique habitat with both uh, native prairie, wetlands, and also um, remnant uh, uh, moreno landscapes as well. So it makes sort of a unique landscape uh, in the Saskatoon region and uh, provides home to a lot of unique species. Within the city limits, uh, the swale covers is approximately 300 hectares in size and uh, runs from Central Avenue and northeast part of the city. Uh, also, with, as part of the swale, there's a couple other conservation areas that uh, Miwasan manages including uh, Crocus Prairie, which is owned by the University of Saskatchewan, uh, Sass Natural Grassland Site, which is a remnant fescue prairie site, which is owned by Miwasan, and then the Miwasan Northeast Swale, which is actually a city of Saskatoon property that Miwasan manages for them. And you can see that on the map here, uh, the light purple color is the Saskatoon, uh, the, sorry, the Miwasan Northeast Swale. Uh, this diagram shows sort of the build-out plans for the Northeast Swale. And as you can see, there's a series of roads throughout the swale. Uh, on the very west side, I don't know if my cursor is showing up, but you can see is Central Avenue. South side is Fedoric Drive, and this road has just opened this last uh, 12 months. And then the new McCormick Road extension, which uh, will uh, tie into the new bridge that's uh, being created. Uh, being built at the north side of, the, of Saskatoon. So the city, uh, so the swale is being built upon as well. There is a new subdivision, Evergreen, which is almost completed on the south side and the new subdivision of Aspen Ridge on the west side as well as is uh, in phase one of development. So as Miwasan, we're trying to manage this site with uh, the city growing up around it and trying to you know, maintain the ecological values of the site, the conservation values of the site, provide bird habitat and wildlife habitat as the city continues to grow around it. Also, part of the site is being used for uh, public access as well. So there's gonna be a series of hiking trails being developed, uh, infrastructure put in as well. So we're trying to balance that uh, urban growth and protecting those conservation values. is sort of the, uh, sort of the opportunity that we're here at Miwasan that we're trying uh, to deal with. So at the Northeast Swale over the last uh, five years we've been documenting 
the various species at risk that we've been finding and, and also rare species as well. Uh, we have historical records of uh, burrowing owls nesting on the site uh, dating back to the 1980s. But of course, with the uh, burrowing owl, uh, the population uh, has shrunk and uh, the range has declined. But historically in the Saskatoon region, we used to find burrowing owls nesting in this part of the city, which was quite, uh, quite unique. And I remember them as a kid driving into the city, uh, seeing burrowing owls along the highway. However, in the swale, we do have other species at risk and that we've been uh, documenting over the years. Uh, common nighthawk have been seen. Loggerhead shrike, we actually have two loggerhead shrikes nesting on either side of the uh, side of the swale and using the swale for foraging habitat. Uh, we have historical records of Sprague's pipit in the last five years, uh, barn swallow, baird sparrow, horn grebe on the wetlands, short-eared owl. Uh, the trail camera picture from last year, you can see there's actually a short-eared owl in the middle of January on the site, and that's uh, one of the part of our ecological monitoring. We're using trail cameras, and we're capturing uh, species at risk, even the short-eared owl on this blurry picture. Uh, Western grebe, which is another uh, wetland species, and then wet, uh, yellow rail. Amphibians, we have northern leopard frogs on the site, and uh, also mammals, we do have little brown bat and badger. And then plants, we have several rare plants on the site. Uh, crowfoot violet, which flowers usually at the end of uh, May, and we have them documented on along the ridges in the site, uh, narrow leaf plantain, and then also Plains Rough Fescue has just been uh, listed as a rare species in Saskatchewan. It's uh, ranked S3, which means uh, it's a, uh, the species has become uh, rare and is now a reportable, um, reported tract species. Part of the issue with this species is, uh, you know, there are large extension, uh, expansion of uh, plains or fescue grasslands in Saskatchewan. However, they've been declining over the last uh, several decades with invasion of non-native grasses like Kentucky bluegrass, encroachment of uh, uh, shrubs and trees, including the western snowberry. And we've seen this at our sites here at uh, the Northeast Swale as well with that decline. Uh, and one of the other sites that we're doing this program on, enhancing for, is Beaver Creek Conservation Area. It's approximately two quarter sections in size. Uh, we have an interpretive center on the site and uh, where we, we have uh, uh, approximately 30,000 people visiting uh, the site every year. Um, Beaver Creek is located south of the city on Highway 219. Uh, on the, if you head down south of the city to the Dakota Dunes Casino, it's along the way there. Uh, south boundary of the property is uh, Beaver Creek or Brightwater Creek itself. And then on the north side of the north half of the property, or north three quarters of the property, is actually uh, sand dune prairie complexes with a combination of stabilized sand dunes and uh, some partially unstable sand dunes as well. The other site just north of there along the river is uh, Cranberry Flats Conservation Area. So this site is also a, a stabilized sand dune complex uh, with, uh, with native grasslands. It, uh, this one also is a very popular site for people accessing the river, a uh, lot of hiking, uh, people on bikes as well, mountain bikes, and then also people accessing the beaches along the river. Uh, we, most of the sand dunes are stabilized on this site, however, we do have some uh, destabilized sand dunes along the, the riverbank slope, which provides some unique habitat for species at risk. Uh, this slide, we are showing some of the different species at risk that we do have at Beaver Creek and, and Cranberry Flats Conservation Area. Uh, this year, we've actually came across a nest of a common nighthawk uh, down at Beaver Creek. We have uh, loggerhead shrike, sprague's pipit, barn swallow, baird sparrow, and bobolink uh, using these sites, on the, especially at uh, the north half of uh, Beaver Creek Conservation Area. Uh, amphibians, northern leopard frogs being close to the river, we have, and along the uh, Beaver Creek, we have a lot of northern leopard frog habitat use. Uh, also badgers and little brown bats. Uh, this last year, uh, Candace Newfeld with Environment Canada uh, confirmed our historical records of smooth goosefoot, which is a threatened plant species. Uh, that plant species likes destabilized sand dunes and require, it's an annual plant that requires that shifting sands to, uh, you know, to help propagate. And uh, she can reconfirmed those populations for us. Uh, also this year, there's an, uh, an insect called uh, Gibson sand, big sand tiger beetle, which just got added to the threatened list. 
and uh, we had some vol um, some people were out uh, hiking at uh, Cranberry Flats this year along the uh, trails along the river, and they came across this uh, uh, tiger sand beetle. And uh, this picture is actually not one of at that site. This picture is uh, that Joshua Erickson took from um, Douglas Provincial Park. But uh, it has, we've recorded uh, tiger sand beetle on this site. And we're looking at doing some volunteer events next year to confirm the extent of the population at uh, Cranberry Flats. Also, our sites provide habitat for other species, not just uh, rare species or species at risk. Uh, at the Northeast Swale, uh, two years ago, we uh, confirmed that there was a sharp-tailed grouse lek on the site. And uh, this lek is, uh, we confirmed with the Ministry of Environment, and there's approximately 40 plus males that are using this dancing ground every spring for the sharp-tailed grouse. I was out there in February and confirmed that we still, they're still actively using the site and they were busy dancing in the snowbank. Um, every year we stick a trail camera up on the site and we document a uh, number of birds and I'm gonna to try to see if this video works. And uh, just with our trail cameras, we can uh, capture some interesting video of the uh, birds dancing out on the lake here. And as you can see the males, their arms are flung out and uh, tails are up and they're spinning around in circles in the top. And it's quite interesting to watch those birds uh, on the dancing grounds. Also, we get a lot of other species using our sites, you know, co you know mammals, coyotes, uh, red fox. Uh, we also have a lot of deer activity, uh, both mule deer and white-tailed deer. And uh, definitely they're our public favorite when they go out on the sites and they see deer. Uh, they also like our uh, trail cameras as well, getting a nice uh, close-up every once in a while and going for some selfies here. Part of uh, our role at Miwasin is we do ecological monitoring of our sites. So long-term monitoring of the river valley and our conservation areas, grassland areas as well. At the Northeast Swale in the last uh, two years, or uh, three years actually, we've been establishing some permanent monitoring plots. And uh, what these plots are, they're um, approximately 3.14 hectares in size uh, with a uh, centroid in the middle and with a monitoring post where we actually place our wildlife cameras on. And then we, they run approximately 100 meters um, diameter or radius out. So 200 meters diameter in a circle. And within that, we wanna do our nested uh, monitoring programs within that. Uh, in the last couple of years, what we've done is uh, we've done uh, range, range health assessments uh, plant species composition and rebel pool monitoring. And our intention is to do other monitoring programs as well within these monitoring plots. Um, within the, the swale as well, we will have uh, trail development as well. Uh, the pink trail called the Recreational uh, Zone Trail was actually built last year and it provides public access. And then the yellow trail, which is the Eco Core Mo Trail, will be developed this year uh, in 20, uh, summer of 2018. So this is just a picture of some of the monitoring programs that we've done. Uh, up in the top uh, right-hand corner is our summer student, Andrea, and with uh, Dr. Eric Lamb from the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, she was our summer student last year, but was also working on her fourth year plant ecology uh, thesis. And uh, that's where she was doing the species composition and health assessment work. Uh, in the middle picture is our summer student, Alex, last year helping out. Uh, he's actually a very active birder and was helping us with uh, the birding. Uh, monitoring and Erin uh, Tomlinson, you can't see her face, but uh, she's the resource management technician uh, here at New Walson, sort of my partner in crime. Uh, her and I do all the, uh, we, we lead the resource management program here at New Walson. Um, so you can see a picture of our monitoring post in the center of our plots uh, with trail camera, and then also some of the other different activities, uh, grazing cage monitoring, uh, robel pole readings, and then also we have, uh, we started dabbling with an acoustic monitor last year uh, to just record uh, bird calls on our sites to get some idea of breeding bird activity. Uh, one of the things we found with the, with the acoustic monitor that it's really data rich. You get a lot of recordings that you have to go through. And uh, we will continue the program this year for uh, birds, but also we're looking at using it for Northern Leopard Frog occurrences as well. Uh, the last several years, we've received funding from TD Friends of the, uh, of the Environment to deliver bio blitzes. 
And so these are one day um, activities or two day activities where we're getting volunteers, citizen scientists to come out and to help us uh, to, uh, document biodiversity at the Northeast Swale. Uh, we do everything from uh, plants to birds to insects to water quality and uh, it's a great way to engage uh, the public in uh, going out and collecting data at the swale. Uh, the information that we collect we uh, put into various uh, citizen science databases including uh, iNaturalist and eBirds and so that data can be shared with uh, other people externally. It's also a great way to engage the public in science. Uh, one of the other activities also that we deliver at the swale is uh, we have a very robust um, or we have an educational program where uh, Kenton Lysak, the, the guy in the uh, chest waders in the top left hand corner picture, he's our senior interpreter at New Austin and he del delivers uh, uh, educational programs with school groups at the swale every year. So this last year we did um, some breeding bird surveys uh, going out you know, pre-dawn sampling for bird calls and uh, our summer student Alex last year led the program and uh, we visited uh, several of our monitoring sites and recorded um, bird calls and, and, and visual observations as well. Uh, highlighted in yellow are uh, grassland related type species that we were monitoring for. We were recording all species uh, uh, that we found and you can notice on the left hand side a lot of uh, wetland species because this, you know, there is a series of wetlands throughout the swale. But what I, we were interested in was looking at the, you know, the population of grassland birds on the site. As you can see, you know, we had a lot of meadowlarks, uh, clay colored sparrows and savanna sparrows, some dripping sparrows as well. And uh, those are an indicator of sort of the habitat quality on the site. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed the last uh, several decades is the site has a you know, high level of uh, western snowberry and wolf willow population and increase in Kentucky bluegrass as well. And you know, the, looking at the breeding bird survey results, sort of that indicates sort of that type of habitat quality that we have. As part of Andrea's uh, thesis project, uh, she was doing uh, uh, permanent, as far as the permanent monitoring plots, she was looking at uh, species composition as well. So she was running transects and running quadrats with, within each of those monitoring plots. So this is plot number four, it's sort of the center of the swale, uh, sort of indicative of what the swale looks like. What we found with her monitoring, what we found was that 40% of the swale was Kentucky bluegrass and a very trace amount of Plains Rough Fescue. And then uh, higher occurrence of western snowberry shrub and then sedge species. Uh, you know, if we would have been in this site about 20 years ago, probably we would have noticed a higher uh, composition of plains rough fescue and a lower amount of western snowberry. So, you know, we've seen this shift in this site to more of a Kentucky bluegrass, uh, western snowberry uh, sedge community. Uh, our nearby site, uh, the Sassanatra grasslands, uh, we've done some long-term monitoring on the site from the 1990s when uh, New Austin took over the site. And as you can see, uh, if you look at the data from uh, you know, 1993 uh, on the top graph, uh, the presence of uh, western snowberry and Kentucky bluegrass compared to 2003, you've seen that tremendous increase in those species. If we would go back and repeat that monitoring, we would probably see a higher incidence of both those species as well. If you look at the bottom graph, looking at uh, the presence of Plains Rough Fescue, Kentucky Bluegrass, Western Porcupine Grass, and Wolf Willow comparing 93 to 2003, you can see that decline of the native grasses and the increase of the Wolf Willow and Kentucky Bluegrass. So we're seeing the same trends both in Saskatoon Natural Grasslands and the Northeast Swale. And part of that issue is, uh, is there were a couple of issues. One is uh, in the last uh, decade or decade and a half, we've had an increase in moisture in the Saskatoon region. Uh, we've, been, we've gone through a wet cycle so that really helps bring along the western snowberry, wolf willow and Kentucky bluegrass. Also we've uh, seen a lack of disturbance in these sites as well. Uh, Sassanatra grasslands is 43 acres in size, fairly small, or sorry 34 acres in size, fairly small and uh, we haven't had any grazing or prescribed burning on that site in the last decade which is probably that lack of disturbance has seen caused that increase in those species. And the same as the Northeast Swale. Northeast Swale 20 years ago was a, a grazed pasture and you know, anecdotally it was have fairly heavily grazed. 
we've removed that disturbance from that site and with, you know, with some small disturbance occurring over the last decade, but it's still not seeing that annual uh, grazing cycle. So that's probably resulted in this shift in species composition. So if you look at the vegetation community guide, uh, looking at sort of the Aston Parkland Lomi range site, uh, which is probably comparable to what this area would have been, uh, the dominant vegetation community would have been a plains rough fescue, wheatgrass community, um, and then uh, you know shifting down through uh, the different vegetation states based on this climax. Where we're at right now with the northeast swale, it's looking like it's either in the disc climax on the left-hand side where it's a snowberry wolf willow sedge community with a lack of uh, fire or at the very bottom uh, Kentucky bluegrass sedge community. So we're somewhere in this disc climax um, within, the, uh, within that site. And so as a, as a uh, land manager trying to manage for uh, biodiversity and uh, wildlife habitat and you know, also rare species as well, we're trying to figure out ways to manage to turn these community types back into more of a native plant community and using different tools at our disposal to do that. So, you know, the grasslands evolved under, you know, climate grazing and fire, you know, over the last 10,000 years, you know, climate would be droughts or floods or wet cycles or normal cycles. Grazing would have been, you know, done through various means, uh, bison, uh, elk, moose, uh, pronghorn, that type of grazing. And then also the, the smaller grazers as well, like rodents and, uh, you know, gophers species like that. And then fire, you know, uh, the Saskatoon region would have historically seen a fire return interval of about seven to a 15 year cycle. And that too has altered, you know, that disturbance regime in the Saskatoon region. So, you know, the climate has stayed constant, you know, which normally fluctuates, but that grazing has changed on this landscape. Um, you know, we would have had historically, you know, once the bison were removed from the area, there would have been cattle grazing, but as urban urbanization increased around the area, we would have lost that uh, grazing on that site as well. So, you know, trying to manage um, habitats for, you know, species at risk, each species requires unique uh, landscape preferences and they avoid certain things as well. So as a, as a land manager, knowing what the different species require for habitat requirements uh, helps you can start planning for how you're gonna manage these species. So I, I have a series of slides here from uh, Heather Pete Ham. Uh, she sent me these and they're showing sort of the different, uh, sort of from a graphical perspective, what the different uh, species at risk require for habitat requirements. So this one, the first one here is uh, loggerhead shrike. And uh, loggerhead shrikes, you know, like open habitat with, you know, some low trees and maybe things like shelter belts. But what they do avoid is large, dense uh, bush and tree covers. Uh, they try and stay away from roads because of uh, potential collisions. And also that noise may cause abandonment. Also, they do like, you know, something that they can sit on and either to, you know, uh, to put their prey on uh, like uh, barbed wire or even uh, thorny species like thorny buffalo berry as well. So, you know, if we're trying to manage for loggerhead trike, these are the uh, considerations uh, to look at. Also loggerhead trike like uh, variable height uh, vegetation surrounding their, their, their uh, nesting sites as well. Uh, this next one is Sprague's pipit. So the Sprague's pipit uh, as well avoids roads. Uh, they avoid uh, heavy litter, so dense litter accumulations of ungrazed grass, but also they avoid bare ground. And then also they avoid uh, uh, tall, dense vegetation. So sort of managing uh, a grassland site with sort of medium height and medium density, and then also moderate litter levels provides sort of the best habitat for Sprague's pipit. Uh, large blocks as well, they like large, uh, you know, approximately quarter section minimum for uh, bird habitat or for nesting habitat. And then also they try and avoid uh, shrubs and trees as well. So sort of that more open range type uh, habitat preference. Uh, common nighthawk, which we have on a few of our sites. Um, you know, they need, uh, you know, healthy insect populations for foraging. So they want to be near water or wetlands. Uh, they don't uh, do well near you know, treed and woody encroachment vegetation because they like that open area and open grasslands. 
and uh, also uh, they like sand dune areas or areas with open hilltops where they can nest in as well and that's where we found them uh, the one nesting this year was sort of that open area as well so that's the conditions for a, a common nighthawk. Uh, next one is short-eared owl and so we do have short-eared owls both at the Swale and at Beaver Creek we have seen them there and uh, they like large open grassland areas as well and with medium height vegetation and then also access to uh, repairing areas for, for their forage and they try and avoid shrubby areas as well. Uh, next one is yellow rail. So we have a uh, documented occurrence of yellow rail uh, adjacent to the swale a couple of years ago and uh, we don't have we haven't had them on the site in the last couple of years though but uh, their nesting habitats or their habitat preferences are uh, they don't like you know fairly heavily grazed areas but they do like areas where there's sufficient litter and you know not too tall of vegetation as well and then they like open areas around the wetlands and then northern leopard frogs uh, they require three distinct habitats one for their breeding cycle one for their summer uh, uh, feeding habitat and then also their wintering ponds as well and so each one has different criteria and requires different um, management and different considerations as well as well so in the swale we know we have uh, them on the site uh, during the, the the feeding cycle and in the breeding as well we don't know where they're wintering in the swale and that's one of the things that we're going to be looking for this spring and this fall is trying to find out where they're wintering at beaver creek conservation area we we think they're uh they're filling all three uh distinct habitats at beaver creek and uh, we don't know exactly where which ponds they're wintering in but we we feel they're wintering at beaver creek as well So there's different uh, habitat preferences for the different species at risk and, and grassland birds. And so this table or this graph here shows sort of the, uh, some work done by Knopf in 1996 showing the different sort of habitat structures and grazing pressures that can be applied to create that distinct habitat. And uh, this is more for Southern Saskatchewan, not necessarily applicable to Saskatoon, but we have some of the similar species here. And so you can see like with the Sprague's pipit, they sort of like that short to medium uh, grass cover, uh, the case and sparrow with like a little bit more shrubby material and you can manipulate that with grazing pressure and, 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 and uh, type of grazing activities. And so that's what we're trying to look do here at Miwasan at these sites. So what we're, one of the things that we are trying to do is uh, create sort of uh, habitat patchiness and heterogeneity on that landscape. Right now, if you look at the Northeast Swale or Sass Natural Grasslands, you know, we're seeing a major uh, shift into those plant communities into a sort of a snowberry, wolf willow, Kentucky bluegrass, you know, almost a monoculture of those three species. And we're trying to, you know, make it more heterogeneity to it by adding, uh, you know, by creating some patchiness, shift some of the plant communities back to native grasslands, reduce some of that shrub cover, and uh, you know, do, but do it over a temporal scale. So do it over several years. Do some of the work over different seasons, and then also spatially as well. So within parts of the site, but then also on the landscape as well, trying to create that spatial uh, patchiness. So at Miwasan, we have an integrated resource management program where we use we have different tools in our toolbox to try and manage these conservation sites. So we use prescribed burning and conservation grazing as two tools. We have a very active invasive species uh, program. Uh, I was talking to Caitlin at, before the webinar started and about 50% of our efforts are actually spent dealing with invasive species within the Miwasan Valley. Uh, we do a lot of ecological restoration programs. Uh, site maintenance, we do manage sites for the public. So we do a lot of work, whether it's site cleanups or uh, fixing sites, uh, but also dealing with day-to-day -day litter and issues as well ecological monitoring programs and then awareness uh, we're finding awareness is actually one of the big uh, parts of our program creating that awareness about the value of native grasslands about species at risk uh, the, uh, the, the issues that relate to inv invasive species that's a really big part of our program and we're doing more and more of that every every year so uh, this is uh, a map of our uh, some invasive species control that we've done in the Sass Natural Grasslands, which is the site in this very south central area 
Uh, this is uh, the middle area is an area called uh, owned by the University of Saskatchewan, and we call it the U of S uh, buffer lands. And then this is the start of the northeast swale here. Uh, the yellow dots are common tansy, which is a provincial that's a noxious weed. Uh, the blue dots is absinthe. And then uh, also we have leafy spurge popping up on the site, which is a uh, uh, green dot. And actually, this is an older map. Uh, our leafy spurge densities are actually even higher than what's mapped here. But you know, this is showing some of the, the, the individual plants or patches that we've been controlling uh, the last couple of years for these invasive species. One of the, uh, the decisions that both Aaron and I started here three years ago was uh, to be really aggressive on these um, noxious weeds and knock them out of the sites as quickly as possible and using a sort of an integrated approach, get these sites, deal with the invasive species first and the noxious weeds, and then start dealing with the habitat enhancement work. So within our invasive species program, we have a sort of a, a tool chest available. Uh, we use prescribed birding and grazing to deal with invasive species. Uh, we do a lot of hand removal work as well for certain species, uh, like baby's breath and uh, nodding thistle. Um, also, it's a great way to engage volunteers uh, on that project. And uh, it's a great, uh, great way to uh, keep the summer students busy in the summer as well. Um, biocontrol, we do uh, biocontrol releases for leafy spurge. Uh, throughout several sites within the River Valley. We collect uh, leafy spurge beetles at uh, Basan Campground near Moose Jaw every year and uh, bring them up and release them on sites, especially sites that are really difficult to use herbicide control on. Uh, mechanical removal as well, so mowing and uh, other methods. Uh, we do use herbicides and uh, you know, being in an urban, semi-urban area does become, you know, those tricky to use herbicides, but we, you know, we use it as more of a spot spray application and uh, you know, it is one of the tools that we have to use, uh, especially with some of these uh, uh, nasty noxious weeds like leafy spurge and uh, common tansy. And then awareness, we do a lot of awareness and education programs regarding invasive species in the Saskatoon region and across the province as well. Uh, we also do uh, restoration programs. And uh, this is uh, within the, the Northeast Swale on, in the, the eco recreational zone. This is a storm pond that the city uh, built approximately 10 years ago. Uh, the site was built to help storm water out of Evergreen and Silver Springs community. Uh, on the right-hand side of the map is a wet pond and then it, the overflow drains through this uh, storm, dry storm pond that eventually ends up in the river. Uh, the site when it was built, it was uh, dug out to handle the storm water, but then there was no restoration work done on it and it was really left abandoned. And uh, it became one of our sites actually for uh, noxious weed tours in the Saskatoon region um, for several years. Um, Iwasa now is uh, working with the city of Saskatoon to restore this site. And are, over the next 10 years, we're gonna be turning this back into sort of a, try and bring it back into a, a Plains Rough Fescue native grassland community type. And so that's part of our habitat enhancement of this of the swale. So prescribed burning is one of the programs that um, Iwasan has been using in Saskatoon for the last uh, 30 years. Uh, when Dr. Uh, Jim Romo came to Saskatoon in the mid 1980s, and he was the manager of the Kernan Prairie site, the university's Kernan Prairie site, he started working with our predecessor uh, here at Miwasan, uh, Luke Delaney, who had been with Miwasan for 32 years. And uh, Dr. Romo and uh, Luke uh, did quite a, uh, quite a bit of prescribed burning together within the uh, Miwasan sites, using uh, prescribed burning as a tool to renew and rejuvenate our native grasslands, um, trying to deal with uh, encroachment of shrubs, uh, reinvigorate the health of our uh, plains rough fescue, and use it for other tools. Uh, we use prescribed burning uh, to create a different uh, patchiness on the landscape. So we use it uh, to create spatial patchiness, whether it's uh, you know, burning uh, units of you know, one to two hectares in size, or we use it to create small micro uh, habitat patchiness as well. So the photo in the top uh, left-hand corner, that was a burn done, uh, fairly thick Kentucky bluegrass site, and this is the greening up after the, about three weeks after the burn, but you can see that, uh, that patchiness on the, within that site from that burn. Um, also within the spatial patchiness in the bottom right-hand corner, that was a burn done a couple of years ago 
uh, middle of March uh, when there was still snow on the ground and uh, we're burning between the snow patches and that's creating the, some of that spatial patchiness as well. Uh, the bottom left hand corner that's uh, burning through a uh, wolf willow community in Kentucky bluegrass and the top hand corner is actually an aspen stand where we're rejuvenating that aspen stand with uh, fire became decadent and a lot of uh, old growth and the aspen was renewing itself. Also, we do uh, prescribe burning on a temporal uh, patchiness, so at different times of the year. So the top uh, picture, right hand corner or left hand corner, was a burn done in mid-April when we had a winter like this year where there was still lots of snow, and uh, so in April burns. The right top right hand corner was a fall burn uh, done in sort of November ish type of thing, and then the bottom picture in the green there was actually a burn done in June. Um, it was actually on a site with some leafy spurge and so the Kentucky bluegrass was nice and green and uh, trying to knock back the leafy spurge with a fire during while well, it was actively growing um, but also burning in that green green period as well so creating that patchiness on that landscape both spatially and then also at different times of the year so this is a map showing um, the swale with our prescribed burning from 2008 and showing the different patches that we've burnt uh, over that time and you can see as well uh, from 2013 to 2017 the timing of the burns as well. So that's creating that patchiness on that landscape with fire. Uh, this is Beaver Creek Conservation Area. Uh, the yellow areas are prescribed burns that we've done in the past and maybe some accidental burns that have occurred with uh, public uh, accidental fires. Uh, the orange or the red ones are burns that we did last year, last spring. And then the green areas are areas that we're planning to prescribe burns this spring that we did the preparation work for last fall. Uh, every year we, we develop a series of uh, detailed prescribed burn plans and prepare the sites in the fall for next year, uh, knowing that we probably won't complete more than 25% of them, but being prepared ahead of time uh, makes it uh, to deal with specific weather conditions and smoke conditions and uh, timing requirements for our burns. So that's why we over prepare our number of burn units. And then this is Beaver Creek Conservation Area. Uh, the blue areas are areas that we've burned uh, previously, and then the green areas are areas that we're, we have prepared burn units for this year uh, available. So with our prescribed burning program, uh, we work with a lot of partners uh, uh, to do our prescribed burns. Uh, in this picture here, uh, this was a burn that we did at the swale two years ago and uh, we have several partners including people from the city of uh, Saskatoon, Ministry of Agriculture, Nature Conservancy of Saskatchewan, Nature Conservancy of Canada and the University of Saskatchewan helping us out with this prescribed burn. Uh, we do a lot of joint training with other agencies. Uh, we had some staff involved last week uh, with some training at, with, from Parks Canada. Uh, every burn that we do, we do a prescriptive uh, burn plan where we have specific management objectives and very specific burn prescriptions that we follow. Uh, some of the burn prescriptions uh, talk about direction of wind, the timing of the burn, uh, when, what are the wind conditions, temperature conditions, humidity conditions, uh, which way is the wind blowing. Uh, one of the things that we're really cautious of is also smoke management. Uh, being on the edge of the city or being near roads, we wanna make sure that uh, smoke is not having an impact. Also, uh, the, the, the term smoke jammers, uh, that's dealing with the public. You know, people see smoke in the air. We get a lot of people coming out curious to see what's going on. So we usually have a, one of our interpreter staff uh, there available to, to engage the public and talk to them about prescribed burns. Uh, every burn that we do uh, within city limits, we get a permit from the uh, city of Saskatoon Fire Marshal but we also uh, provide notifications to the local municipality and to our neighbors as well. Uh, preparation is the big key to prescribe burning. Uh, we pr uh, prepare fire guards at well ahead of time, usually uh, six to eight months ahead of time if possible, um, if, if we're able to, and uh, having proper equipment and resources available. Uh, partnerships I mentioned before, you know, we have a limited staff, so we try and work with as many partners as possible with our burns. Uh, communication, we do quite a bit of communication both with uh, the media and with the public. And then also uh, creating awareness about the, the role of fire playing in the landscape and the benefits uh, of using fire as a management tool. 
So this was a video uh, that one of our summer students did last year of a prescribed burn at the Northeast Swale as part of the restoration of that dry pond. Um, so the, the first step before starting the restoration process was we wanted to burn out that area and then start doing weed control. And uh, the reason I like showing this little video, it's about one minute video taking over a couple of days, but showing sort of the, the process that we go through on a prescribed burn. And it'll go through fairly quick here. Hopefully it'll work. It's a little sluggish. Okay, there we go. And you can see uh, I'm the guy in the yellow suit there with the drip torch uh, running the flame along. Uh, we have crews there. We have water truck on the road. And then we have crews with water packs on the back and then uh, a tool called the flapper, which is used to snuff out uh, the flames. Um, this whole process, this whole video was actually two and a half days worth of, or uh, three mornings of work uh, to com complete this type of burn. So it's a, it's a really uh, uh, time consuming process, fairly labor intensive. And then also, uh, you know, it's it's not a quick drop a match and run type of a uh, process. We're taking our time, burning things slowly. Here in this case, we're doing a nice slow bur back burn. The crews are there to snuff out the fire fairly quickly if, it, if anything uh, happens. And the video stopped. Okay. Oh, there we go. And then this is uh, sort of in the bottom lands here, showing uh, our burn here. Not much, not thick, dense uh, vegetation material, but you can see how we're doing strip fires, you know, to burn the area. And how our crews are spaced out and mopping up as it's back burning. Also, one of the other tools that we use uh, is uh, targeted conservation grazing. So we're not, uh, the reason we use the word conservation grazing is because we're, we're not, we're not using grazing as a management tool or as a production tool. We're using it for meeting our conservation objectives. And then targeted because we're doing specific grazing to meet specific management objectives and in a specific location. Uh, so this is an uh, uh, air, aerial shot that the city of Saskatoon did when we were doing some grazing at the Swale in uh, 2015. And uh, on the bottom left-hand corner here, you can see uh, sheep this is, we had 375 sheep grazing in this location here. And so we were, we do electric, we use electric fencing and uh, try and confine our sheep into a certain location and to meet specific management objectives. So in this case here, what we're trying to do is control Western snowberry and then also uh, knock back some of the Kentucky bluegrass as well. Try and get some hoof action going and to break up that uh, thick um, litter layer of Kentucky bluegrass. But you can see in this photo the different patchiness that's created from the sheep. Up in the uh, top left-hand corner, you can see where they had grazed before, then also in the top right-hand corner as well. You can see that patchiness that was created by the grazing. Uh, this is just some shots of the grazing cages and you can see what we were trying to do is uh, with the grazing was trying to break down that litter layer of that Kentucky bluegrass. What happens with Kentucky bluegrass, it forms a dense thick mat of litter and uh, where it prevents other species from coming up. So with the sheep grazing, what we were trying to do in some areas was to try and break down that litter layer. And um, looking back at some of the grazing uh, stock densities, we were actually, in, you know, for short duration, we were grazing up to five times heavier than the recommended stocking rate for the site. But, you know, that was to meet specific management objectives for controlling the shrubs and also knocking back the Kentucky bluegrass. And you can see with the wolf willow, uh, this in the bottom right-hand corner here, uh, the wolf willow, uh, the sheep, when they came in last year, uh, we were working with uh, Sue Mikulski from uh, East End. Uh, she brought her sheep up. Uh, they had never actually seen wolf willow and we were concerned that uh, the sheep may not go after them. So what we did was we clipped a bunch of wolf willow, fed them to the sheep in the night pens for the first couple of days. Then when we released them onto the site, they, when they went specifically after that wolf willow and uh, clipped, the buds, or clipped the tops off. And we timed our grazing at the end of August when the uh, plants were putting the nutrients down into the roots for over winter. And we were hoping that we can maybe knock back some of this wolf willow with the timing of grazing. And then also with our grazing program as well, we're trying to create temporal patchiness as well. So different timing of the year. Um, our former shepherd, uh, Jared Epp, who had worked for us for uh, about 15 years, um, he had done uh, 
grazing at different times of the year, May, June, July, August into September, and that creates that temporal patchiness. So, you know, grazing in uh, June, July is different than grazing like in the bottom right-hand corner in mid-September when the, the can of thistle has gone to flower. So you get different uh, patchiness, uh, temporal patchiness created by that as well. So in this photo, you can see, uh, you know, just the sort of the sheep grazing from last year targeting uh, Canada thistle, western snowberry, and Kentucky bluegrass. And uh, yeah, it was a, a sort of a fun project to work with. And we get a lot of media attention as well when we're doing our targeted grazing program. And then this is sort of the patchiness, the different areas that we've grazed over the last five years at the swale. And then when you overlay that patchiness, so the fires and the burning, and that interaction between fire and grazing, this pullout map, you can see where we're, we've done both grazing and burning on the same site. And so that creates that temporal spatial patchiness and heterogeneity on that landscape. So this is a photo from uh, last year, uh, burning in the swale. We did some burns in one area in early April, went back in uh, July with a tour with the Native Plant Society of Saskatchewan uh, at, during Native Prairie, Native Prairie Appreciation Week and looking for the Western Red Lily. Uh, another name for Western Red Lily is Fire Lily and they respond to fire. And uh, you know we saw that uh, you know the Western Red Lily pop up. And then this is another picture of the grazing. You can see the city in the background. So some of the management uh, implications. So when, as managing these natural areas and these grassland sites, um, you know, do you take a single species approach or do you look at a multi-species approach? Uh, when we're trying to manage these sites for uh, species at risk or grassland birds, you know, do we manage specifically for a Sprague's pipit or do we manage for the whole suite of grassland birds using that site? Uh, one of the things that we're doing at Miwasan is we're taking that multi-species approach and creating that uh, patchiness and that heterogeneity so that we can provide as much possible habitat characteristics for all species available. Uh, we use multiple tools. Uh, we use prescribed burning. Uh, we are looking at using conservation mowing for dealing with uh, especially shrubs, uh, western snowberry and uh, wolf willow. We've done some in the past and it seems to be quite effective with, uh, um, with dealing with those shrubs and then following up with a different management tool behind whether it's burning or grazing. Also doing multiple species grazing. Um, we have done some goat grazing in the past. We've definitely focused on sheep grazing. One of the things that we want to do is try and bring uh, cattle grazing back into the swale as well. The sheep are sort of multi-species grazer. You know, they'll graze the shrubs and the forbs and the grass. Goats will target the shrubs. But we, uh, the cattle would really focus on that Kentucky bluegrass for us and deal with some of that thick dense litter that needs to be managed. So we're looking at options at uh, bringing some cattle grazing into that site. And then also that interaction of those multiple tools and um, bringing them all together and working them together to, to meet our management objectives. And then also uh, sites that are degraded, look at ways of uh, restoring them and bring them back. Uh, whether, and depends what your management objectives are as well, but uh, using that as part of creating wildlife habitat. So with that, um, I think that that's all I have for the presentation. And I think, Caitlin, we have some time for some questions. Great. Thank you very much, Annie. That was a really detailed presentation. I know I really enjoyed it. I'm sure our listeners out there did as well. Um, to any of our listeners out there, if you have any questions, you're welcome to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. Um, there is a question here. Do you pay carbon tax when you burn? <laughs> Very good question. Um, no, we don't. And uh, we did have someone from Agriculture Canada last year uh, um, contact us about our prescribed burning program and look at uh, how much carbon we release during our, our burning process. And uh, the, the researcher commented back, he said, oh, that's that's minor amount that you're, you know, that we're releasing. Uh, you know, one, we have thought a little bit about the carbon uh, release during our prescribed burns. However, you know, there has been research showing too that, you know, with the uh, rejuvenated grasslands, you know, and after disturbance, whether it's grazing or burning, the increase in carbon capture afterwards negates any release that's done. Um, I don't have the you know, exact papers in front of me, but there is some research showing that, you know, the increase in carbon capture once that grassland is renewed uh, negates any of those uh, those carbon offsets. 
Hmm, that's great. Good to know. Thank you. Um, our next question is, if a person wants to get involved with MeWASIT and volunteer, what sort of opportunities are available? Yeah, so we have uh, different uh, volunteer opportunities. Uh, we always uh, we have opportunities, you know, uh, like in our resource management program, uh, invasive species polls, uh, citizen science uh, monitoring projects, you know, bio blitzes, that type of thing. Also, we do some tree planting, some habitat restoration projects as well. And then also we we do a big annual garbage cleanup in the River Valley. So uh, yeah, if you're interested, in, if someone's interested in volunteering, just uh, contact our office and uh, go on our website, uh, miwasson.com, and uh, .com, and uh, you can contact us and uh, express your interest for volunteering. Thank you. Um, a listener named Kanzi would like to know: Do you integrate traditional ecological knowledge of First Nations territory into the management of the landscape? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, that's one of the things that we worked on a resource management plan for the uh, Miwasan Valley. Uh, we completed that plan last March of 2017. And uh, that was actually one of the items that was identified as part of the plan is to start integrating uh, that traditional knowledge into our management processes. Uh, it's something that we haven't done yet. But uh, it's something we're definitely interested in. Um, we do a lot of joint work with Wanuskewin Heritage Park uh, at the north end of Saskatoon, and you know they're trying to incorporate that knowledge into their management planning. So, you know, working together with them, we're hoping to learn from them as well and, and incorporate that into our into our programming. Thank you for that answer. Um, a listener named Nolan would like to know um, what types of grazers have you used for weed control and what's been the most successful? Okay, yeah, we've used uh, uh, sheep and goats gra goat grazing. Uh, the goat, when we were using the goat grazing, that was specifically targeting uh, shrub encroachment and that was actually very effective. And uh, I, you know, if you're looking at dealing with uh, any shrub encroachment or uh, anything like carragana, uh, I definitely would recommend that. Um, in terms of forbs like leafy spurge, we have the sheep have been used in the past for leafy spurge control, and uh, yeah, we were quite a, happy with that as well. So I guess it depends on what your management objective is. I think if you're looking at dealing with invasive grasses, uh, you know the cattle are probably your best option with that, uh, depending on the timing as well. So it, it's sort of you have to take that multi-species look and see what your location is, what access do you have to those species as well, and uh, and try to incorporate that in. So, yeah, it, 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 it's not a, uh, the easiest, you know, it's not a quick answer. It's, you know, you have to look at the situation of the site as well. Thank you for that answer. Um, that looks like all the questions that we have at the moment. So I'd just like to remind our listeners that PCAP has uh, another Native Prairie Speaker Series webinar going on next week on Wednesday, and that's about unmanned aerial vehicles for natural resource management. And just go to the PCAP website, www.pcap-sk.org, and click on Communications, and then click on Native Prairie Speaker Series, and you can... Um, register for the webinar there. Um, I just wanted to also let our listeners know that this video, this webinar has been recorded and will be uploaded to the PCAP YouTube channel later today or tomorrow. And you're welcome to check that out if you um, missed the beginning or if you'd like to pass it on to a friend who wasn't able to make it today. And when you leave this webinar, you'll receive an email um, or a quick questionnaire that'll pop up. If you don't mind filling it out, it'll just take a minute and this helps us um, get data that we need to keep our funding for these webinars to keep them going into the future. Um, with that, I guess um, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in and listening to our webinar. And thank you very much, Renny, for the really informative presentation. Um, the pictures were awesome. The video was great. And thank you very much for the detail that you provided. And um, you're definitely very well versed in, in these topics. So thank you, Renny. Thank you, Caitlin. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.